But anyway, so Pablo is, uh, he's a respectable numerical relativist. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, Pablo, you know me, right? Uh, we're going to ask you questions all the time. I'm going to interrupt you. I want to make fun of you, etc. because uh, the students are very shy. And uh, you should take it as much personally as you want. So uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Pao. Thank you for the invitation to you and the rest of the organizing committee. I hope one day I had the chance to meet uh, all of you in person in Cuba. It's one of the places that I'm hoping to visit uh, at some point. But at this point, at the, uh, what I'm going to do today, as Pao just asked me to do, is to go in a more of a didactical type of lecturing, which uh, there is ample time for you to stop me, ask me questions. So this is not going to be details of the latest results of my group or any other group or anything. So what I want to attempt doing is to tell you what we do in numerical relativity, at least in one of the problems that we focus, the other one is to answer the question, why would you spend time doing this thing? But most of the talk will be on how we do it. So hopefully I will awake the interest of you of getting into numerical relativity type of research or simulations. So let's start with the first one. So this is a movie that my group, when we were in Georgia Tech produced after the detection of the merger of two neutron stars from LIGO. And that was in 2017, in August, the day 17. And what you're gonna see on the left, I haven't started the simulation, it's gonna see the two neutron stars. Those are contours of matter density. And in the right hand side, you will see the same time frame but in gravitational waves that we calculated. So here we go. And obviously there are only very few orbits. The simulations are very, very expensive. LIGO, so many, many more orbits. And actually what it turns out that this part of the merger of the neutron stars, LIGO did not see. The frequency of the gravitational waves at this point was too high for LIGO to see it. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, although there is a strong indication that there was the result of the merger of the two neutron stars was a black hole, still is debatable in that regard. All right, so this is what we do, at least in this problem. What we do is we produce simulations that represents the in spiral and merger of compact objects. We use the Einstein equations mostly because we believe that Einstein was right, okay? And the results that we have are used to interpret, okay? And characterize the observations by interferometers. So this is what we do. And why we do it is because of this. This is, a no this is yeah? Pablo. Pablo, one question. You say that uh, this uh, merger was out of the LIGO uh, bandwidth. Is it uh, true that uh, this is uh, for all neutron star binaries? And if so, why? Likely for this one will be until LIGO reaches the sensitivity that it has been designed and we could get very lucky on that because uh, uh, the frequencies as, as, uh, as the sensitivity of LIGO increases is gonna drop the, the, I mean, it's gonna be able to see weaker signals and it'd be able to also expand the, the, the range of frequencies that it see. But likely that for this type of things, uh, it, it will be very challenging for LIGO to see the merger. But the way that if you had a binary of uh, two neutron stars in our, in our galaxy, you would see them, right? Is, we will see it because of the amplitude will be much higher. So you can actually gain frequency band by that. I, di I don't have, but I think you're going to have a gravitational wave talk, right? At some point. Did you yeah. invite a LIGO or a Virgo speaker? 
uh, if you are a Lego member, yes. No, 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 no. But I mean, I didn't want to go into the details of gravitational wave detection. I can stop this and show you the the sensitivity curve of, of LIGO. Maybe we can do that in the in the questions at the end, so I don't interrupt the slide presentation. No, but, but you know that it, 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 so this is not a regular presentation. So I am hoping that they will interrupt you constantly with the questions. No, but the uh, thing is that right now we'll have to switch to another software, and I don't want to get ah, the problems. I see. I see. I'll okay. Can, no. I'll put the LIGO curve at the end, and then uh, you can ask. Okay. Me. Okay. Okay. All right. So now, okay. So that's what we do. This is why we do it mostly. Recently, in numerical relativity, the focus has been connecting to gravitational wave detection. So what you have here is the figure number one in the PRL paper that announced the first detection. That was in 2015, September 14. And uh, what you see here in the, in the panel at the top is, this, is the signal. So here, let me just write down here. So this one here and this one here where the signals detected in Hanford, that is in the state of Washington near, near Seattle, and in Livingston, Louisiana, that is near New Orleans, okay? And that is amazingly what LIGO saw. I mean, uh, by the way, I, you know, I'm not a young person as Paul said, and when I started uh, studying this, we never imagined that the first detection was gonna be that strong but uh, we were very, very lucky. All right, so that's the data. And what you see here is the same data, but superimposed with two things. The red line and the blue line is the profile that we as a community got by solving Einstein equations that best match the data. And that profile was that of gravitational waves generated by a collision of binary black holes, okay? Let's forget up for the moment about what it says, the reconstructor. Let's just look at that. It matches quite well the signal. Of course, there is noise. If you subtract this from the top, you get this noise here, okay? And you can see that, uh, you know, to a good approximation, there is not a signal there, it's just noise. So what Tal is telling you that our approximation or our model of what uh, nature is telling you is actually quite good. And this is just one example. The, the panels below is typically when you do signal analysis in this, uh, in this business, you also plot how the frequency of this signal, you can see here that by the way, time is in the horizontal direction. You can see that as time goes by, the amplitude increases. That's what is called a chirp, okay? And also the frequency increases. So you can see here that in this panel, the amplitude is represented by color. So the brighter the color, the larger the amplitude. And here is what you see here. And also that the frequency goes up with time. So it, it, it matches what it's at. Any questions about this? People, don't, don't, don't be shy, please. It's just that it's so perfect, my explanation, that uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I, I doubt it very much. There is no room for questions. All right. I have, I have a question. I have a question. Uh, the difference between the, the actual uh, measurement and experiment and the reconstructor uh, uh, curve uh, will be only because of instrumental error or something else. I mean, it's it's a very good it's a very good feeling, but uh, what what's the the difference uh, about? Okay, so now you're talking about the reconstructed that I uh, that I skipped that. So what it what it do, they do there, okay, is that uh, there are two types of reconstructing the signal. One of them is what it says that by wavelets, and the other one is by template. Okay by wavelets is that, and that is a standard problem in signal processing. You assume that your signal is a linear superposition of functions. In this case, they call wavelets. It's like when you do Fourier 
um, decomposition and so on. And they, in this case, they were uh, close to Gaussian sinusoidals. And what they do is there is no physics there. They just assume that the signal is a superposition of that. You do your best feeding to that, and that's how you reconstruct, okay? With the other one, they actually use templates. And the templates here, for uh, to use a technical word, template is, is the, the shape of the waveform that we get from either numerical relativity or some uh, uh, semi-analytic approaches as post-Newtonian. So that is the other way. And both of them match quite well. Both of them match quite well, okay? Now, the differences, of course, there are things there, two sources of, main sources of, of uh, different, one of them is noise in the detector. That is, uh, you know, you see the residual uh, basically at the bottom. And the other one is the ignorance that you have, uh, especially with the templates, of not knowing exactly the parameters of the binary. And I'm going to spend at the end of the lecture time talking about that, OK? The fact that you have a waveform or a template that matches the data, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have matched the parameters of the physical system that produced that signal, OK? Does that answer the question? Yes, yes, thank you. Any other one? All right. Okay. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, does this result have uh, some relation with the Aligo project? With a what? Aligo oh. project. Advanced Lego. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the thing is that uh, the, because to build this instrument, you need to go to the taxpayers and ask for money, okay? <laughs> the, the, the approach that they took is in steps, okay? They took a initial LIGO, LIGO, and advanced LIGO, and now they call it the 3G, the third generation. Those, LIGO is LIGO, it's just at the stage in which they are. This one here is, we were very lucky. This is the first time that basically was turned on to what is called uh, close to design sensitivity. Uh, but they're, they're still working. Actually, right now, the, the instrument is off and it will be, I, I, I don't know that even that I'm in LIGO, but I don't pay as much attention as uh, I should. But uh, uh, pretty soon it's going to reach uh, uh, advanced, I mean, design sensitivity. And you, you're going to have many, many detections per day. I mean, well, not many, but I mean, you have several detections per day. It's, it's going to be now more like... Uh, data-driven science like proper astronomy. Um, but this one was, uh, was done when the detector was still not up to speed. There had been a, another upgrade between the one now and the one that happened with the first detection. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, I have answered two questions, so I'm done with two-thirds of the talk, okay? <laughs> All right. Numerical relativity, how, okay? So I'm gonna start by, uh, I'm gonna start by giving you a perspective of how things evolve, okay? So just to give you a sense of time here, in uh, around 1995, that's when I got my first job, faculty job, I was in Penn State, and that was when the first time that the community got together, the community that we were interested in solving Einstein equations in a computer, and we focus on the problem that is a two-body problem in general relativity. The reason we did that is because at the same time, around the late 80s, that was when Kip Thorne, another one, mostly Kip Thorne, was going around the world uh, pushing for the idea that uh, we need to support gravitational wave interferometry to detect gravitational waves. And that we were gonna need help from theoreticians to interpret the data, help to, the idea was to find this needle in the stack because they thought that the signals were gonna be varied in the noise, which they are, but they were not as bad as predicted. So this thing here on the left, this thing here on the left, 
is a result of the you know, most sophisticated simulation at that time. A single black hole done in a supercomputer, okay, solving the full set of Einstein equations, but it was a single black hole. The solution is known analytically. It's a Schwarzschild solution. The black hole was not even rotating. And look what happened. This, you can see here, there are problems with the boundary conditions. These spikes here, there are instabilities. And then the problem is that the simulation only lasted, just to give you an idea, because those of you who had taken those of you who have taken G, I'm oh, sorry. Those of you who have taken GR, we know that we use uh, dimensionless units, or in this case, because there is a parameter and the problem is the mass of the black hole, the simulation lasted less than 5M. Okay. And it Can crashed. we translate that into Christian? It is, it crashed immediately. So it But took... what is 5M five, five, five in terms of... Uh, what uh, can, can you give another unit which uh, gives what? us uh, some sense? can you can you use uh, other kind of units so that people can can follow this can, speak up pal i am can speaking I up what? can i use a, a different kind of unit instead of m oh my gosh okay what do you want <laughs> you want do you want kilometers or you want seconds or what do you want well cucumbers i don't know something physical this is there is no more physics than the mass of a black hole. I mean, after that, I mean, everything. yes, Pablo, I'm following you, but I, 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 I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with them. If I, M, I'm, if I'm, I can, I'm just being, I'm just joking. Okay, so yes, M, I know. Let's say that we put M equal to one solar mass black hole. Okay, one solar mass black hole, just for reference. Okay, just for reference. The, the radius, um, I mean, no, let me raise this. Okay. So if you convert masses into units of time, one solar mass is five microseconds. Okay. So the, multiply this by this, and you get that this is just 25 microseconds for a one solar mass black hole, okay? Nice. I can do it in kilometers too, because the mass of the sun in kilometers is 1.5 kilometers. So this one here, the time in kilometers will be then, what is it, seven? No, 7.5 kilometers, right? I think people are going to be more comfortable if you use a unit, a time units for the time. So let's stick to a 25 uh, microseconds. All right. Sounds good. If I, may, if I may ask here, what is the relation? I, I understand, I think, uh, that the relation from mass to uh, dimensions of length comes, comes from the relation between the, um, the mass of the black hole determines the Schwarzschild radius. So one right. can establish that relation. So to time, what would be that relation? Yeah, so the thing the thing here, okay, you just said G, everything equal to one. Okay. All right. And then in the same way as you saw that you have R is equal, I mean it for what is it, two? M, let me just C square G, right? And that's why we can set radius to mass the same, okay? You can do the same thing with time, okay? You can then just, let's see, what would be a good way to do it, Pau? Um, oh, gee. You can do the same thing, seriously. Believe me. You can convert... Right, you can convert radius. You can. The thing is, you can convert everything into. Just pick the unit that you want, and once that you start playing with the C's and the G's, you can convert time into grams, distance into grams, or you can do everything in terms of uh, 
uh, sectors, everything in terms of length. Let's not get bogged down in the units, okay? Let's, let's keep keep the big perspective here. You can go to a textbook and I think, uh, uh, oh, you will get it there. All right. So, the, now look at the, this picture on the right. 10 years, okay? 10 years. In 10 years, that is a snapshot of the first simulation of the collision of two black holes. That was done by the group that uh, at the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. There was another group that was at the University of Texas at Brownsville at that point that also did it. But this is it. You know, you can see the black dots are the horizons of the black hole. That uh, yellow thing is the, the gravitational radiation and so on. So, 10 years. So how, do, why did it take so long? There were different factors that I'm gonna go through all of them except the last one that contribute. First of all, we had the ability, we start having the ability of setting up initial data that is astrophysically relevant. Second, even that the Einstein equations that we have learned to, to write in t-shirts and so on, g mu nu equal to a pi t mu nu, even that, that we knew this from Einstein, if you write it like that and try to solve them, it's useless. You had to, you had to reshape the equations and I'm gonna go a little bit about that. The other thing is that you are dealing with black holes, okay? So, and black hole as in the previous talk, they have singularities, so you need to, be able to handle the singularities. And last but not least, remember that Einstein say that coordinates don't have any physical meaning. So you have the freedom of picking coordinates and that should help you to be able to solve the problem. Not quite as we do, for instance, in electromagnetism that you have, you have two point charged particles and maybe picking some spheroidal coordinates is better and so on. This goes a little bit beyond that. Why? Because one thing to remember is that in these equations here, we're not only solving for what the matter is doing, but we're also solving by what the curvature of space-time is doing. So this is a unique problem in which, for instance, in electromagnetism, you solve for the electric and magnetic fields, but the background, the space-time is fixed. As John Wheeler put it, with GR, you are actually solving from, for the arena over which the phenomena is taking place. So that is the complication here. And those are intrinsically tied to the choice of quarants. And the last is a computational aspect that we needed to improve our technology there. All right. So the general problem is in, in essence, similar to what you do in electrodynamics or when you're taking any course in, in a mathematical course. So you have, you have a time t zero space, okay, domain. Okay. You have some boundaries, even that in this case, you have basically an infinite domain, but you don't have an infinite computer time to, I mean, computer resources to do it. So you had to put artificial boundaries. So you need boundary conditions, okay? Then what you do is you, it, let's say that you're solving the wave equation. Okay, we can even put a source if you want to. And uh, then what you do is you specify data initially. You let's say that this is the boundary. You also specify the data and the boundary and you march forward, okay? So that is what we're gonna do, okay? Notice that the Einstein equation that I wrote before put the space time together. So what we're now doing is deconstructing what Einstein did. We're now picking a way of integrating in time and then marching the way that the space time and matter counter evolves. So, this is what is called, uh, what Wheeler, John Wheeler, used to call geometric dynamics. 
that is the history, the time history of the geometry of space. All right. So that that is what. now here with the black holes. If you had two black holes orbiting, okay. The problem also that you have to be careful here is about the radiation. This is the radiation, the gravitational waves that you want to calculate. And the gravitational waves in principle, you want to calculate how they look like at infinity because for practical purposes, the waves that arrive in the earth from those that were generated few redshifts away is infinity for practical purposes, okay? So what you want is to be able from a calculation that is finite in extent to be able to extract the way how it looks far away. All right. And these boundaries that is artificial, you have to be careful that there is no way that things bounce back, that you know, radiation bounce back. So that is another challenge. We thought for many years that that's going to be very difficult. It turns out that it was not as bad as we thought. Any questions? Good. Is, it, is everything clear, really? <clears throat> I, I, I do actually have, have one question about this bounce back. Um, well, I don't understand how you would get a uh, bouncing back of your radiation unless you explicitly coded it to have periodic boundaries or to have uh, reflective boundaries. Yeah, no, that's precisely the thing. There are ways to do boundary conditions. There, of course, there are Dirichlet. Uh, that is, you specify what the value of the function is L. That assumes that you know what the value of the function is there, okay? There are others given in terms of derivatives, right, of the, of the function that, you know, the Neumann. But the, what we use is a, a kind of a mixed derivative in which we assume that, for instance, for this wave equation here, that the function is outgoing. This is R minus T, okay? And with that, you can construct a, an equation that is holds in the boundary that only allows for things to get out, not to bounce back, not to convene, okay? So that is a standard, you know, in, in, uh, in acoustics or in fluid dynamics, that is standard outgoing boundary conditions. It's not as simple as that, but it turns out that the, the, the difficulties were not as uh, tremendous. And what about what about the geometry of the problem? Well, uh, when solving this equation, uh, will we use any other kind of coordinate? I see in the in the bordering uh, boundary in uh, condition you use R uh, that will give okay, you some. Okay, for this case, since it's, for this case, since it's, uh, one dimensional, I will use x. Okay, but you're right because we are we we are in three D. The the wave like equations are three dimensional. And the, we pick an outgoing direction, radial direction, in which we do that. But since it's not perfect and the boundaries are not spherical, you get a little bit of radiation. But again, we managed to find tricks, adjustments, and so on, in which it radiate, uh, this uh, spurious bouncing is not as, as uh, it does not affect the quality of the gravitational wave form that we want to compute. And here, th th let me take the opportunity here. In this field, there are different areas that enter here. Of course, you have the mathematical side. You need to know GR. You have to know astrophysics to some extent to connect to reality. But the important thing here also, you need to know um, a numerical analysis. Mostly we, we benefit from all the history in fluid dynamics. That's, that's how that has happened. And the third one, uh, creative engineering. I mean, you really have to be open that uh, some of the theorems from numerical analysis will not apply and you just try to adjust things as you go okay so those of you if students who are interested in that the, the, the thing that i encourage my students is that they can move from all different from all these elements and then build a career depending on what they want i mean astrophysics pure gr or uh, going to the software engineer and so on. So it's, you, you, get, you get the skills, uh, you get a broad range of skills doing this stuff. Okay? All right. So good set of equations. As I say, this, the Einstein equations are ab above, okay? This index here are space-time indices. They are one for time, this one's here, and three for space. 
And in essence, what you have there is a geometry equals matter energy. And as also, again, John Wheeler used to say, geometry tells matter how to move and matter tells geometry how to curve. But now let's focus on this guy here, which is the Einstein tensor. That is a complicated tensor that involves second derivatives of this object here, which is the metric. And the metric, again, it, among other things, it allows you to calculate distance between events, okay? But, uh, and also has derivatives here that they are, uh, I forgot, they are products of derivatives and so on. And again, here, they are both space and time derivatives. So this is a big mess of, of a tensor. So the first thing, as I mentioned, that we, that we do is we decompose the space into what we call three plus one, all right? Let's focus on the figure in the bottom. And again, in, in, our, in, in GR, we typically draw diagrams in which time goes, flows in the vertical direction and space in the horizontal direction, okay? So now imagine that this here is how the space looks at a given time t, okay, right? And then this one here is how space looks at a time t plus delta t. And what I mean by space, I'm including everything. It's not only the coordinates, but also the curvature. So that I tried to make it a little bit curvy there. So what we're going to try to do is, as I say, is an initial value problem in which you do how space will change from this time to this delta time, okay? And for that one, instead of having the metric, the full metric of the space time, we split that into a metric that is the metric of the hypersurface plus a term that tells you how things change normal to that sur surface. Now this is a unit normal. So you have to have a sense of how much time has elapsed. And that is given by this lab function, which by the way is connected to one of the questions that, uh, that was asked in the previous presentation about the redshift. It tells you how fast your clock ticks from this point here directly above it. So we have the freedom of controlling that clock because it's just meaningless from the physical point of view. You had the freedom in your simulation of saying, okay, I'm going to go from here to here or from here to there. So that is what we call a coordinate freedom, but it's a coordinate freedom of time, okay? The other freedom that we have is that if we call this the event P at this time, okay, we don't have to necessarily label the event directly above by P. We can have coordinate shifts in space in which we say, no, look, I'd rather call it this point here P. It's just a label. There is no physics involved. And that freedom is encapsulated by what is called the shift vector. All right. So the lapse and the shift is the one freedom that we have to label points. Okay. So right now then what we have is that the metric, which is the one that we're trying to obtain from the Einstein equations, we're gonna do it in terms of this spatial metric, but there is something that is missing here, okay? It's that we need to make reference because this metric here is only intrinsic to this surface. We need to make reference to how that surface is embedded in the space time. Just to give you an idea, maybe you you have uh, you have uh, look at my video where I not not the slide my video. This is a flat surface, okay. This is still a flat surface, intrinsically flat. This this, but the way that is embedded in in this room is different. The embedding of this thing is different from this. Is that clear? Or are you lost yes. now? No, I mean, 
Okay. No, pero no, te no, 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 Okay. Yeah, my, my only question is why would you this, uh, use this? Uh, I guess you will tell it now, but why would you use this lab function shift vector? Why not just analyze it um, over the, the initial surface? I'll tell you why, because otherwise you cannot do black holes. And it's very important to have the ability of slowing your clock and moving points around. But that will come at the end. Okay. All right. Okay, so just to make it in a very simple way. What we're, the other thing that we're doing is, uh, remember, I mentioned that uh, the Einstein equations got second order uh, derivatives, you know, second order derivatives, and it will have time derivatives. So what we're going to do also is we're going to do what uh, we typically do when we solve Newton's second law, that we go from this to one in which you introduce the definition of velocity, OK? And then you have an equation for the velocity, which this is basically the acceleration. And, uh, and then you have a definition of velocity. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that. So in the context, in the context of, in this context, if we're gonna be so, having equations for gamma AB, okay, we need also an equation for the velocity of gamma AB. So that is, it. That, is a, that is the thing that we're talking about here. All right? If you want another example, is this one here, the wave equation that I was just telling you. Instead of us solving it this way, that you can do it, okay? What we do is we introduce an auxiliary variable, and then we write two equations, and we solve them simultaneously. It's easier to solve an initial value problem as a set of first time derivatives, uh, I mean, first order time derivatives system than do it in the second order, okay? And that will come back in a second. Okay, now, doing it with the Einstein equations, by the way, I put it equal to zero because we're gonna do vacuum for, the, for this remainder of this talk. So what we do is this thing here, that, uh, you know, it has all the second derivatives of the metric. Okay. We are going to go and do what I mentioned we did with the wave equation or with uh, what's it called, the uh, Newton's second law, and write it as two sets of equations. This is basically a definition. It's just like equivalent to what we have for... Uh, the definition of velocity, okay? Okay. So this plays the role of a velocity and X here plays the role of this thing here. So this object here is what is called extrinsic curvature. You can view it as a metric velocity or you can also view it as a measure of curvature, a measure of how this surface here is embedded in the higher dimensional space. The other thing is that you're going to say, okay, fine. You have the metric here. You have the extrinsic curvature, but you have here, the Einstein equations have a notion of curvature. Okay. It, so where is that notion of curvature? Well, this thing here is what encapsulates the curvature from the special metric, this IJ. Okay. So it's, everything is there, everything is there. Now the problem is that these equations, which by the way, they were introduced many, many years many year ago and they were used for basically first attempts of quantizing gravity and so on. If you grab them like that and write the code to solve the equations, you don't go anywhere. You don't go anywhere. The snapshot of a single black hole that I show is precisely what's done with these equations. They are, they, for, in that regard, they are useless. Okay. So then Shivata Nakamura in 1995 start playing with that. Instead of having the equations for these two objects here, they start playing with what is called conformal transformation, traceless decomposition. I'm not gonna go into this thing here because uh, 
uh, you will lose track of the global picture. But the f following thing is that they, they decompose this into these two pieces, one factor that it just multiplies, and this one here. And for this guy here, they decompose into the trace and that. So they just split them even more. Let me just postpone for the moment discussion about this thing here. And with that, Baumher and Shapiro in 1998, 99, rewrote these equations, the, the rewrote this ones here, the ADM equations, and this is a mess that you get. It looks bad, but it actually is not that bad. And this is, my friends, these are the equations that we use. They have not changed at all since uh, 1999. You will find them basically implemented like that in the codes. There is a little, compl these days we don't do the numerical codes by hand. What we do is we write Python scripts or mathematical scripts to generate the code, but uh, that's what it is, okay, in full glory. All right, so now let me, let me do an analogy because this is just a mess of equations. Let me do an analogy with something that we know, which is Maxwell equations, okay? If you go to a textbook and grab Maxwell's equations, they look like that. You have, I'm, I'm writing them with a time derivative on the left because I want to do it as a time, you know, initial value problem. So if you grab them like that, okay, you have that two evolution equations for the electric and magnetic field. You have a Poisson equation here that tells you given the source, how the electric field, uh, uh, you know, most satisfied. And you have something here that is a constraint. That is the, at any time, again, at any time during the evolution, okay, you started with initial E and B, at any time during the evolution, you had to have that this is satisfied, okay? Of course, this one had to be satisfied, but you need to find an equation how to evolve the, the charge density and the current, okay? Now, if you, you can solve it like this, there is, you know, there are ways to do it, but it's, it's complicated and you are gonna be having problems of stability and so on. So, to, so let's think about this as the ADM equations that they are not as, as nice to handle. So the way to get around that is you go and do the following. You also remember that in electromagnetism, there's some uh, potentials, and one of them is the vector potential A, here it is, and the other one is the scalar, okay? So if you introduce, instead of working with B, you work with A, you come up to the equations here at the bottom. You have the equation here that is basically this, in which you eliminate B, and you have that instead of the equation for A, you have an equation, for B, you have an equation for A. Then you make progress there, okay? Things are get, starting to get a little bit better, and I'll tell you in a second why. Why? Because if you ignore uh, this... Sorry, can I ask a question on this? This and this, okay? And then you, what you do is you plug E here. Pablo. You get a, a, yes, Pablo? Okay, so you're getting a question from Costas. Wait a second, let me just finish this and then I'll answer. Okay. And then what you're going to get is a wave equation for A. And we know how to solve wave equations. So that is the reason why this is more convenient. The closer that you can get to and when you have a system to be like a wave equation, if it has wave-like solutions, the better you are. Okay, question. Uh, this uh, this procedure in electrodynamics can be done if you only if you assume that the uh, space is simply connected. So, uh, as we know in relativity, in general relativity, it's not uh, necessary that the uh, space is simply connected. So, are you always able to do this uh, kind of procedure in uh, relativistic space times? Yeah, I'll show you how. The proof is that these equations here, 
they basically do that. They have been, uh, uh, you can prove that they have that property that I'm talking about, okay? You can kind of guess it. Let, let me just, uh, let me just show where that thing is. Okay, so if you, if you substitute this here, the, the, the Laplacian operator for the metric is here. So you kind of get that. And this, these uh, algebraic terms don't, don't, don't give you any problem. The thing, the problems are the derivatives. So that's why this, this does the trick. And also, if you put uh, this, where is it? Uh, uh, I, th I have a missing term here, I think. But if you put uh, this one here, you get the same thing. Okay, so it that was that was the the I don't know if it was specifically by design, but that was what uh, the benefit of of having those equations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, but it's not enough. It turns out that it turns out that doing this splitting in these two equations is not enough. Why? Because this term, how do you, oh, there we go. This, okay, this term here spoils the fun because you're going to have it. To have uh, the wave equations, you need to get rid of that, 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 that term there, okay? And uh, that what, uh, what Shivata Nakamura did, which is this term here, where they say, okay, this is the term that's giving me problem and I cannot have a wave equation. I'm gonna introduce an extra variable, gamma, that is the divergence of that. And with that one, then you add another equation, you can find an equation for gamma. And now you have three equations in which everything is as a numerical analysis person will say, will be uh, 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 explicitly hyperbolic, so to speak. Okay. And then that's that. That's how it works. So the Einstein equations that we use, the formulation of VSSN has those properties and the codes are stable, amazingly stable. Einstein constraints, okay? So here is your, here is your Einstein tensor, okay? And remember, we are doing the decomposition in which you have things along the normal, and things that you can project along the space. So what I'm doing here is I'm projecting the Einstein tensor along the normal and then doing some along the normal and the space. And you get these sets of equations here. Again, K is extrinsic curvature and R is a Ricci tensor and there are metrics there, whatever. So as I mentioned at the beginning, your data is the spatial metric and the extrinsic curvature or velocity of the metric. You need to provide data for that. It's just like in Newton's second law that you need to produce how the position of the particle at time t equals zero and its velocity at time t equals zero. It's exactly the same thing. Or in electromagnetism that you had to provide the value of, uh, of the electric field and the value of the vector potential t equals zero. Now, as with electromagnetism, you have that, you don't have the freedom like with Newton's second law to pick position and velocity arbitrarily. You have to pick the electric field in such a way that it satisfies this equation. And that is a constraint. That is a constraint. You have to do that, okay? Sorry. Okay, so here we go. Look at the problem. So again, sorry for changing attention. I mixed the slides from different talks. So we have to have the metric strength of curvature, but we only have two equations, the Hamiltonian momentum constraint. Now, these are four equations. This is a, one equation, it's a scalar. And this equation, because the index run now is spatial, is three. So you have four equations, but we have 12 unknowns. We have six here, and we have six here. So now you have the problem that you, ha you don't have enough equations to specify completely the problem. So the question is, 
which four quantities out of these 12 will be fixed by these four equations? And let's go back to electromagnetism. That is something that we understand. So here again, the data is electric field and uh, vector potential, six quantities, you know, three components in the electric field and three in that one. The only constraint that we have is this. Remember, here I'm working in vacuum. I put that the charge distribution is zero. So this is only one equation. So now, the, because we don't have a constraint for the vector potential, you can pick anything you want. You are free to pick anything you want. Okay. But now the question is, which of the three components of the electric field will be fixed by this? And if you look at the textbooks, what the trick to do is the following. You split the electric field into two terms. One that is transverse, that is one that uh, by construction, okay, satisfies that the divergence of T is equal to zero. You just construct that one. And the other one is a longitudinal term that is the gradient of a scalar field. So this, if you plug this in here, you obtain this equation here that we know how to solve. Now you're solving for one equation, okay? So, and that's what we do. Okay. This is the last set of equations, I, I, I think, okay? So what we do is we do it similar to what I was mentioning with the BSSN equations, that you do some transformal transformations and so on. And what you do is then you convert these equations into one scalar equation for one function. And this one actually can go into being a divergence of a vector. I'm not going to go into details. But anyway, that is how it's done. That is how. Pao, how many more minutes I have? Uh, I don't know. Anything between ten? two and... Uh, can and I have uh, 10 minutes? It's up to you, man. I don't know. Uh, people, uh, are you following everything that Pablo is explaining? Because uh, I have my doubts. I'm going to now switch to the non-mathematical side. Okay. For sure, I mean, the... Look, you uh, wanted gravity... me to tell I had to, have to do numerical relativity. I had to have a little bit of equations here. I didn't, I didn't want that. You imposed that on me. But that's fine. Um, people, do you have any question? It's the moment to ask. Cuba. No, yet we are following the specific. It's okay. Okay. I, I, I tried to do the analogy with, with electromagnetism as much as possible to be able to, so you don't get lost in all these indices here. But now, let me just, now I'm going to switch gears. So I'm done with the initial data. I'm done with equations. So now let's go and talk about the fun which is uh, the astrophysics, okay? All right, so now the question is, where do you put the astrophysics? You have black holes, they have their masses, they have the spins, they are in orbit, so you have to have the, the, the orbital separation, the eccentricity, the spins have some directions. So how do you do that? So what we do is we solve the post-Newtonian equations when the binary is far away from each other, like here, okay? And those, there are some approximations, equations are not that difficult. And if, then we evolve the system to separations in which numerical relativity takes over. And at that point, post-Newtonian feeds the parameters to construct the initial data for numerical relativity. This is a non-trivial exercise, but it can be done. It can be done. That is, that is where the astrophysics enters into the problem, in which you specify typically the mass ratio of the black holes, the spin directions. If you want to have circular or spherical uh, 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 binaries and so on, that's, that's where we do that to be able, at the end of the day, to have a wave representation that has a part that has been calculated by post-Newtonian and a part that is calculated by numerical relativity. All right. So, second to last point, handling the singularities. As you 
here in the talk before, a black hole is a relatively simple object. It has a horizon and a singularity. However, you cannot include the singularity as part of the computational domain. I mean, things will not work. So there are two general approaches, uh, basically, which actually we use uh, in life too. If we have something that we don't like, we remove it. Like when you have a, a cancer or something like that, or when you have a person that you don't like, you avoid it, right? So that's the same approach we use this here. Both cases can be done because of the presence of the horizon. The horizon saves the day. It, what it means is that you can do a little bit of crazy things inside the horizon with the understanding that physical information will not leak out of the horizon and spoil the physics that you're interested in, which is what happens outside of the black hole, in particular gravitational waves. All right, so one of the approaches is black hole excision. As I say, the cartoon in the middle was done many, many years ago by one of my students. And what we do is we just went, here is a snapshot of a single black hole, and we actually went in the computational domain and put zeros here. We just didn't do any computations here, okay? With the understanding that the horizon, we found that the horizon is outside, so you can just get rid of that. And using that, for instance, this is an evolution that I, we did when I was in Penn State. You can evolve black holes. That is, notice that now the evolution goes all the way to 150, uh, 200 M in time, okay? So you can keep now evolving, everything is hoity-toity, right? So that's one way to do it. Now, it is complicated because you had to, even that you put zeros here, you have to be careful about how you do numerical calculations here in this boundary. This is not the same type of boundary that we have outside in which we were talking about uh, uh, gravitational wave radiation bouncing back of the artificial boundary and so on, okay? The other one, the other one uses the coordinates that I mentioned, okay? Remember that uh, the lapse function here, uh, here again, there is a space in this, direction, time in the vertical direction. And what I have here is a typical diagram of a collapsing star. So here's a star that is shrinking. At some point, you have the event horizon popping out, okay? And once that uh, the star has collapsed, a singularity forms, okay? So this is the singularity. So if you're gonna do an evolution, you cannot include this thing here. This, this will make your simulation explode. So the way to do it in this uh, picture that I was saying that you have, you know, geometry dynamics that you evolve from one slice to another one, you cannot have the time elapses in the same way everywhere. Because if you have, if you take a step this large here and you do the same thing here, you are going to hit the singularity. So what we do is we slow down the evolution in such a way that now, let me change colors, you slow it down in which the surfaces wrapped around and they never hit the singularity. Time proceeds as normal, far away, but near the singularity, you slow down the calculation. Now, what is the problem of doing that? The problem of doing that is that they now for instance, for this here, you're really stretching the surface. And stretching the surface has the following problem, that you have grid points in which you're doing numerical calculations. So the, the grid points are going to be also separated by that okay. because of that stretching. And that's when the other object that we talk about, that is the shift vector, comes into the picture. This allows you to shift your grid points in such a way that you don't lose resolution. So it was crucial, the choice of these two objects. And the equations that do the trick, I'm not going to go into deriving or talking about, are this, and it's called the moving puncture gauge. This is what it allowed, together with the BSSN equations, 
This is what it allowed to do the simulations that we do today. And that's it. Those are the, 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 the ingredients. All right, let me just, any questions about this? Because this is crucial. We do not include the black hole singularity in the simulations. So either we excise it or we avoid it. They, there are two camps and uh, they're very successful doing that. One of them, they use excision. Most of the, the rest of the world uses what is this called this singularity avoidance of moving puncture gauge. All right. Gravitational waves. At the end of the day, you want to calculate gravitational waves. This is just a very simple slide where it's a metric. You decompose it in the background that is flat. And these are the perturbations under the appropriate uh, uh, orientation of choices. What you get is that uh, this perturbation decomposes in two polarizations, the cross and the plus polarization. Notice that what this has, you know, oscillatory type of behavior. And what it does is that if you have, for instance, a wave going uh, perpendicular to my screen and you have a circle of points, okay, a gravitational wave, what it will do to those points is to expand them in this direction, contract them in this direction, go back to the original uh, shape and then do the opposite uh, 90 degrees on that. The other polarization is 45 degrees uh, of that. So it will expand it in this direction, contract it in this direction, return to the original state, and then go the thing. That is what LIGO measures. Okay, It measures those two polarizations and how the distances between the mirrors and the interferometer, they change following this. Okay. So then the question is, how do we do it? How do we do it? In, uh, in our simulations. Remember, we are evolving for this object that is a spatial metric. Okay. So how do we go from there to this H plus and H cross? There are several ways of doing it, but I'm just gonna tell you quickly the way that we do it in this cause that, uh, that we have. So from here and this guy, we calculate the not only the Riemann curvature tensor, but we also calculate what is called the vial tensor. Okay, I'm not going to go into details of that, but from the vial tensor, Penrose and other ones computed quantities that are called uh, gauge invariant. That is that they do not depend on the coordinate choice, and from that one you can get to this one because this is basically the second derivative of, of this of these objects here. So that is how, that is the process that we go. Okay. We have our quantities. The reason we go this path is because these quantities depend on coordinates and the laps and the shift. Okay. This one do not depend on anything. You at infinity you get always that the same answer. So you had to go this route to get all the way here. And this is an example, a real example of a simulation that we got from that. Okay. And uh, it, it was originally thought that it was gonna be difficult to do, but uh, the mathematical machinery was there to be able to do it. Three more slides and I'm done, okay? So what's next for numerical relativity? We need better computational infrastructure we need to be able to have faster computers that will allow us to do black holes that are spinning very rapidly, configurations that have eccentricity. One thing that is very important, especially for the space interferometer LISA, is to be able to do simulations of black holes in which the difference of the masses of the black holes are very large. We need to improve in the waveforms that we have so we can help with parameter estimations. There is people who are also interested in studying basically black hole colliders, you know, how very ultra fast black holes collide. And that one will require an improve not only in the computational infrastructure, but also actually in the equations itself. 
uh, there have been very interesting studies about what happens with the horizons uh, of the black holes. The other thing is we need to have a better bridge with post-Newtonian. Remember that post-Newtonian is where we graph the physics that goes, the astrophysics that goes into the initial data to connect it with data analysis. The other thing that I didn't talk about, but I showed the movie about a neutron star is that we need to start adding, uh, adding not only the multi-scale, but multi-physics content to the simulations like uh, neutron star equations of state to be able to do better simulations of gamma ray bursts. You have now, there are simulations of supermassive black hole binaries at the cores of galaxies to see what happens at the end and how that affects the, the core of the galaxy. Uh, in in uh, when you have circumbinary disk around binary black holes, you can also develop connections between the disk around the black hole and the spins, how the jets are produced and so on. And you can also not forget that after all, we're doing mathematical relativity, solving it with a computer. So there are problems like cosmic censorship, you know, can we have naked singularities? Or was Einstein right? To, uh, suppose that we use a different theory of gravity to solve the same problem, see what the differences are. There are uh, serious attempts to do now numerical quantum gravity. Okay? And uh, it was mentioned Hawking radiation in the previous talk. There is, there is a possibility of doing uh, semi-classical calculations in which you can then see how black hole evaporation goes that in non-trivial systems that will require doing numerical work. And also uh, there is a loop quantum cosmology. All right, conclusions. I think that they're very exciting times for numerical relativity. There are many groups interested in, in, in astrophysics, gravitational wave detection, also mathematical relativity. I think that uh, uh, the, yeah, the binary black hole problem in their simplest form in my opinion, is done by the simplest form, you know, comparable masses, spins that are not too high. But there are many, many other things that one can look at. And uh, that, the main driver will continue to be that the binary black holes are one of the most important source of gravitational radiation, okay? And uh, that, for that reason, the American relativity will continue to play a crucial role in the detection and very important in characterizing the sources from the waveform to see what were the parameters of the astrophysical system that led to that radiation. And as in my previous slide, numerical relativity also has great potential to be a tool of discovery in mathematical relativity and quantum gravity. And with that, I'll stop. <coughs> okay. <coughs> So, people, questions for Pablo. I have a question here. Go ahead. Uh, can you give, give us a, an update of the state of uh, LIGO interferometer? What is he doing now? They are doing the upgrade. I don't know the details of that, but they are doing an upgrade in which uh, it will reach sensitivity. And I think. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it will be uh, turned on again at the end of the year or early next year. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Cuba, Diana, Salon in Steak. Come on. Either. I lost everybody or the presentation was so transparent that you didn't give room for questions. But okay, I, I, I do have one, but I don't know how intelligent of a question it is. I suppose we will find out. Um, I, I am currently studying um, the exact solutions of the Einstein equations, which are exhibit wave-like behavior. They call them PP wave space times. Um, so these are exact solutions, and the only thing you have there is is the gravitational wave or an electromagnetic wave or something. And I have always wondered if you have uh, if you have a, a space time containing two black holes or any two things which orbit each other, um, how do the waves manifest themselves in the equations? 
because w when the only thing you have is the waves, it's very it's very easy to see. But I, I don't understand how they would appear uh, in in the analytical description. Yes, very good question. It was oops. The let me just go back to. Okay, so uh, well, it it was everything. Let me see if I can write here. How do I start this thing here again? Uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. All right, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write here because. Okay, I lost the thing. So everything is in that gym you knew in the metric. Everything is there. Okay, it, the waves are there. Okay, and uh, but also there is more to that because remember there is only two polarization of gravitational waves in in Einstein theory. So that object has more than just the the wave content of that. So the key thing in that uh, slide that I mentioned to go from the from the metric and extrinsic curvature to the polarization is precisely how to disentangle the extra stuff. Okay. It's precisely that. And that is not a trivial exercise. Remember that uh, in, in one of the early papers by Einstein, he made the claim that there were no gravitational waves. Okay. He made the claim that there were no gravitational waves. And the reason is that if you work just with the metric, that the metric is subject to changes once that you change coordinates, you can be in a situation in which you can write flat space time, make it look time dependent, and you get the naive view that those are waves. No. What you, and the best, the thing that you can do, and that's what in textbooks you do, you grab the Einstein equations, you linearize it, and you go and write them in a way that represent a wave equation. And even there, the best thing to do is to write it in a, in a wave equation in which you have factored out the fact that things do not depend on coordinates. And where you're left is uh, hopefully physics. And how do you know you have a wave? Well, if you have a wave, the wave has energy. And if, the energy, if you can transfer the energy to an object, you can heat up water, you know, in principle. So you had to do that. You had to not only show that it has a wave-like behavior, but also that there is uh, energy involved. And uh, I remember one of the comments that you had in the previous talk was about how much energy is generated in the collision of black holes. So that's what we do. We grab those uh, waveforms. And we're able to calculate the power radiated by the binary and the total energy by the binary just purely from the gravitational wave. Something that you cannot do if you just have flat space time right in the metric in a, in a wave-like behavior. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, it, it did. Because I, I'm aware of this. Um, you can write any space time with some coordinates which make the metric look like it's oscillating or something. Um, right. But and and that a solution to this is to define waves in an invariant way by, uh, for example, in Maxwell's theory, you have a five-dimensional um, group of isometries or something like this for a plane wave, and so that's how they define the same thing in uh, in general relativity is that a plane wave is something uh, with a five-dimensional group of killing vector fields or, or something like this. Uh, right. But I, I never could imagine how, how one could do this disentangling, which you described. But now I, I understand that that's, yeah. that's what we were seeing. So I thank mean, you. the simplest way, if you want to go just beyond flat space, I, I would recommend do uh, non-rotating black hole perturbation theory, and you get the Zerilli equation or the regic willier equation, that those objects are gauge invariant, and you can see from the... Uh, that they are, they are proper waves. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> Jose, Solne, Miguel, Oris, come on. Ask something. 
or say something. Uh, I have a question, although I, I'm not sure it's very related to what you do. So, uh, do we have any information on? Um, I think I'm losing. Hello, you. am I audible? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, do we have any uh, uh, numerical simulation of a of a simple black hole, say a Schwarzschild black hole, embedded on a nice and uh, on a uh, Robertson Walker space time to see how the system evolves over time? Very good question. Uh, okay, there are analytic solutions. Of course, uh, the Schwarzschild Seeder solution is one embedded in a, in a Schwarzschild space time, or there is also Schwarzschild anti the Seeder. If you want, and there's Friedman Robertson Walker, an analytic solution is what is called the Swiss cheese model. But numerically, there have been very few work done, and actually that is one of the areas that I'm interested in. I'm currently working with a student. And the reason for that is that uh, in addition to having the dynamics of the curvature of space-time due to the curvature of the black hole, you have also the expanding dynamics due to the cosmology. And that introduces uh, uh, little complications on that. And, but there, we're making progress on that. The other one that uh, is also very interesting is that if you're going to use a flat Friedman Robertson Walker cosmology, that is okay for gravitational wave extraction because we can factor out the expansion of the universe and then you are left with an asymptotically flat space time in which you can do calculations of wave extraction, as I mentioned. The part that it would be interesting is to do it in a closed or an open universe type of uh, uh, cosmology. And that one has not been done. Actually, the mathematics that I mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Penrose, um, the scalars and so on has not been done as far as I know for that, for closed manifolds or, or hyperbolic manifold. Okay, thank you. Okay, people, uh, are you alive still? Somewhat. You are alive. I just heard you. But what? What about the Cuba people? Just, just a technical question here. Uh, these uh, simulations are in what? What software do you use? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, also a good question on that. So we have because the codes. Oh, by the way. Uh, if you want to, um, if you want to do these simulations, you can do them in, in a laptop. I mean, uh, the basic ones. Just Google uh, EinsteinToolkit.org, EinsteinToolkit.org, and you can download the code, install it, and do your, uh, we have examples of collisions that the black holes are close to each other, so it can be done. Now the software, because uh, this level of complication in software uh, takes years to develop. Some of our codes are still written in Fortran 90 and C++, nice. but the most modern ones are mostly C++. Some of them are even in Python type of thing and so on. So, but uh, it's a little bit of mixture on that. Okay. Now, the, the part that I, the, the, the part that is a, a little bit challenging is that, uh, again, if you want to get into this business, you can get into the business of software engineering and so on, be very sophisticated in modern ways of uh, doing these codes and so on. But uh, I'm too old for that. So what I use, now do is I use them as a black box. My students and postdocs are the one in the trenches doing that. And... Uh, I, I'm more interested in setting up, you know, the astrophysics problem, extracting data and so on. But you can do it from one end to another. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, people. Is this enough or do you want more? So I was, maybe I can ask something. I was um, 
I'm not entirely sure if I got that right. This, um, um, how was it called? The, the gauge, the moving puncture punct gauge. Mm -hmm. um, this this really sounded to me a bit like a kind of a moving mesh in, in time. Is this correct or am I, um, how, how does this relate? Like, no, the we we do moving meshes. This uh, we do that, but that is the the location of the the refinements. Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, a way to uh, a way to say. It. Suppose let me just do it here in two D. Okay, let me see. Suppose that we have the computational domain and I need to have more points in this side than this, okay? But at some point I need to say, oh, physics change, I need to invest points in this side and I start refining here more and more. That is different from what I call point P, that it has a value X, Y, Z, and T. Okay. The yes. this here, when I have the the same thing later on, this let's say that this is a time t t equals zero, and now I have the same thing at time t equal delta t. I don't necessarily have to call this location p. I can move it around. Okay. I can then say that okay, so this is a point t at t equals zero. And now you have P here at X, Y, at different Z at time delta T. That's what I mean, okay? It allows you to label the points in subsequent times in a different way. And the reason that is important for that, let's say that the black hole singularity is here. And what you want is that due to the stretching or due to effect, you don't want to have that you lose this point by being too close to the singularity. So the lapse and the shifts allows you, it's a very powerful tool for you to be able to relabel points. And that is where you're going to be doing your calculations in such a way that the black hole doesn't suck the points. Because that, if you, there is a very nice, there is a very nice exercise. Let me, there is a very nice exercise that if you have a black hole horizon, you have the singularity here, and you start, okay, a particle here. How long does it take to get? How long does it take to go from here to here if you use coordinates in which alpha is equal to one and beta is equal to zero? And these are called geodesic coordinates, okay? And that is in textbooks. Do you remember, Paul, since you're an expert in GR? Uh, yes, of course. If I remember correctly, it takes 3M or 5M. Three or five m, I think it's five. And so, in five m, again in units of m, a point that has crossed the singularity reaches this point here. So what we're doing is not having a clock that ticks at one, but it ticks at much slower. So this thing here gets slowed down. The use of the shift, we use it because the black holes move. And what we don't want is that a point that was safely stored here, once that the black hole is moving this direction, now we will have that problem. So the shift allows you to shuffle points around to avoid when the black hole comes. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it, it looks like science fiction to me. I mean, I was at the beginning in which we didn't pay attention to these things here. And now the incredible, powerful aspect of being able to exploit Einstein's uh, 
freedom of coordinates tailored to a problem in which you have a black hole that is uh, creating uh, a trouble. I, let's put it in context of cosmology, okay? Another way to do it is if, if you, you have here probably of what is called commoving coordinates. That is coordinates that commove with, uh, with uh, 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 what is it called, with, uh, uh, with expansion of the universe. Oh, I don't know how to erase this thing. But remember, okay, so you have here the universe with some coordinates here. Then it grows and you have it. So you can use coordinates that expand with the universe. So essentially the points they, in coordinates do not move from each other. And that again is exploiting the freedom of picking coordinates to, to solve the problem. Okay, so so did I? I'm I'm a bit um, unsure about what's the meaning kind of of a point if we can shift it like we want to. Um, but I think well, I mean I can for me it's, it's a point like in a space time event because I. It's the label, like... the label. The event is physical. What yes. you call that event is is not physical. So, for instance, you're, you're right now in Cuba, is that right? No, I'm in, I'm in, in Germany, actually. In Germany. Okay, so suppose that I'm going to call it where you are, location 1, 1, 1, now. I can later on arbitrarily call it you know, two comma two comma two because I changed the coordinates, but you're yes. still there. So it's just the labeling of the coordinates. Okay, so so that's nothing else but a different choice of coordinates then. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But the event is real. I mean, you know, you are there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So so in in the end, it boils down to a clever choice of coordinates. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was crucial, a choice of coordinates. So the okay. three ingredients, as I mentioned, perhaps the, the important ones, was uh, a clever choice of coordinates that allows you to avoid the black hole singularity and the form of the Einstein equations. Those are plus initial data, of course. But those were the two ingredients. And it took ah, a I long, see. long time to get them. And the, the interesting thing is that you really had to mess up things to make this code crash. I mean, it, uh, I mean, of course, there are intricacies due to parameters that you set up in the code. And, uh, but from the point of view that the questions are quite robust, the prescription of the coordinates too, so it, it, it is just amazing that, and the one thing that I forgot to mention, I mean, in vacuum, there are no shocks. One of the things that are, is very difficult in computational fluid dynamics or when you're dealing with uh, uh, neutron stars and so on is to handle the shocks. Here, there are no shocks. Space time is, the rigidity that it has is, is such that uh, it doesn't de it doesn't develop sharp features. You can force it to have sharp features, but naturally the equations do not. Like if you were solving uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, it may, you can you can easily form shocks. <clears throat> okay. People, are you satisfied with uh, Pablo's presentation? Do you have more questions? Do you understand everything? Do you have uh, a comment? I, I have a question. Okay. Um, Pablo, you mentioned that you can use this uh, to study cosmic censorship, but if you are taking away the singularity, I mean, how do you do it if you, if you just are? ignoring or avoiding the singularity how do you know when if i mean in the case if 
is it like a naked similarity? How do you know that it is there if you don't take it? Yeah, very good question. So the it's in this one here. Okay, so the the best thing to do it will be to investigate it through the collapse of an object. Okay, in such a way that you prepare the object that it doesn't form a horizon, and that that calculation was done by Shapiro and Tokoski many years ago with a cloud of particles. It has not been done yet again. And the, the proof is not quite conclusive. So what they did is they collapsed the cloud in some arrangement of particles and they could not find a horizon. But not finding a horizon, that doesn't mean that it's not there because precisely maybe what they had, it was a very weird choice of slices and so on that avoid the horizon. By the way, there is a paper by Bob Wall in which you can write Schwarzschild in such coordinates in which it doesn't have the horizon on it. So it you can really twist things around and, 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 and avoid that. So the the thing the thing that uh, the thing that it will be very interesting is to do that calculation and see and see what uh, if it's possible to have an object that has a singularity, but it doesn't have a uh, horizon. I I did something along those lines, and uh, let me see if I can have a a blank. Yeah, I'm going to use this to write. So we have that a rotating black hole. Let's just say you have a parameter a that is the spin. And you have the mass of the black hole. Okay, the a spin is the ratio of the angular momentum to the mass of this thing here in some units. Okay, in some units. So the thing here is that we know that uh, Kerr black hole has a parameter that it has to be less than one. Okay, otherwise it will have a naked singularity. Mm -hmm. So what I did with a student of mine a few years ago, I said, okay, can I, can I have, can I build a black hole that goes above one, all right, so we can have a naked singularity. So look at this formula here, okay. So if you want to increase A to go beyond one, okay, what is, what is the normal thing that people think about it? Well, let's just increase the angular momentum. And how do you do that? Well, you have a rotating black hole and you start dropping particles there that have angular momentum. So the angular momentum of, of this little particle goes into this and the black hole then what it gets is J plus delta J. So you are increasing this thing here. And actually, I think I have it wrong. I think it's J squared over M, but let's just forget about it for a moment. The problem is that when you have when you have that, what you're also doing is that the particle that you're dumping, and that's happening with accretion disk, that's how you spin up uh, a neutron stars or black hole, it also has mass. So you're also increasing the mass. So you increase both the angular momentum and the mass. And it's not a, you cannot beat that. You cannot beat that. Uh, I think there is a paper by Kip Thorne and other ones in which you say that the maximum that you can get, I think, is 0 0.98 by accretion. That is the maximum that you can get. There is no way to go over the uh, equal one threshold by just accreting matter into the black hole. So what I did is say, okay, let's just forget about doing things with J. Let's do things with M. Okay. And this is not astrophysics. This is just mathematical stuff. So I have a rotating black hole that is was fairly largely, I mean, fairly spinning rapidly. And I surrounded that by a cloud. Okay. A scalar field cloud in which the energy of the cloud was negative. So that cloud was accreted by the black hole and the net effect was to decrease the mass of the black hole. Now this is not Hawking radiation because Hawking radiation, this thing is in vacuum and so on. 
this I put the scalar field cloud with negative energy, let it, the black hole accreted. So what happened is that the mass of the black hole went down and as a consequence, the spin went up and it actually went above A equal one, all right? At that point, we lost the ability. We still didn't have the singularity because we were doing singularity avoidance uh, coordinates, but we lost the horizon. We could not find the horizon of the black hole. Now, the thing that I cannot conclude is that, again, if we lost it because there was a naked singularity or we lost it because my coordinates are such that I could not uh, find it, like in, 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 uh, with wall solution. And the interesting thing is that it was not, I think it was naked because the black hole was not stable. And uh, after a while, the black hole went back to be below A equal one and to be a care black hole. So that is a long answer to this problem of co co cosmic censorship. Okay, people. <clears throat> so it's uh, almost nine in Central Europe, Spain. It's uh, 3 p.m. almost in Cuba. It's uh, 3 a.m. in uh, China. We have more questions, so I will find. Speak now or be silent. For Maybe minute. just a follow up. <laughs> How do you define uh, the black hole if you don't find the, the, the horizon, the, the event horizon? No, no, no. I mean, this this was a mathematical type of exercise. The thing that we have is two two components here. We have a singularity with a horizon, and we just added matter. To behave that way and we lost we lost the horizon but the singularity was still there how do i know yeah. that because i calculated curvature uh, uh you know riemann curvature and so on and it was still there it was diverging the way that uh, a black hole curvature diverges okay thank you uh, i have a question mm -hmm. It's a pedagogical advice. What do you recommend to start with this uh, numerical relativity? Just to take the codes and, and go and calculate or? Well, what? that's that's one approach. Let me just tell you what I do with my with my students. I do both things. So I if a student wants to start working with me, I tell him to go to the Einstein toolkit. Dot org, download the code and start running it as a black box. Okay. At the same time, there is a numerical relativity textbook by Baumgart and Shapiro. So that one is the one in which uh, uh, I tell them to start looking at the 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 first the first chapters to see. What are the equations that are included in this code? Okay, so my attempt was to give you a very general perspective of of that. Now, to to understand this, it requires uh, you know a basic course of GR, for which one I recommend uh, the book of Sean Carroll. Okay, so that 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 gives you the, the the general steps for that. And of course, then there is another textbook by uh, uh, Luciano Resola that is more connected to the astrophysics, in which you can uh, then complement with with this. But I would not be afraid of just downloading the code. I and mean, if you are good installing software and understanding how to, you know run things when you in, in, just go ahead and do it and it, it, they have tests there and then you will see how, how it goes and then at, in parallel to this, uh, start the, this tech, other text okay okay thank you mm -hmm. oh by the way 
There is a wonderful uh, mailing list in the Einstein Toolkit that you can send questions and they're very, very helpful in answering all your questions about how install it or understand and set parameters and so on. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> People, um, more questions or uh, we finish here because it's been like uh, I mean, over four hours. And uh, I don't know you, but I am a bit tired. Benny, don't, you don't have to raise your hand, just speak. Uh, I have a last question for you. Uh, is there any way that a gravitational wave can be as, uh, absorbed by the same space time? They can be absorbed by what? Uh, how can be, uh, could be a gravitational wave uh, absorbed? by the uh, space-time itself. Oh, okay. Well, let me see if I understand your question. Okay. Gravitational waves interact with matter and they change matter in the sense that they produce distortions and that's how the light interferometer works and so on. So that there is, there is coupling between matter, uh, between matter and gravitational waves. I mean, there is also coupling between gravitational waves and other waves like electromagnetism and so on on scalar. Now, there is a very interesting problem is that the gravitational waves carry energy. So you can, in principle, have a configuration in which a gravitational wave collapses to form a black hole. Okay. And that has ah. been done, has been done. The collapse of a gravitational wave to form a black hole. Uh, John Wheeler, again, we call it geons, okay? Uh -huh. and, okay. Uh, very interesting calculation. It's just to figure out how much energy you have to concentrate. Like, like everything with, uh, with uh, GI, what matters is compactness. Okay. It's how much mass you put in certain uh, um, size, okay? So it's just you pick a domain and you put a gravitational wave, the size has to be such and the energy has to be such that gravity takes over and then you collapse it to form a black hole. But Benny, why, why were you interested in this? So what is the reason of your question? Hey, I was talking with Fernando in, in the main room and we were to, we were talking about the fact that you when you have a, a, a light a beam of light and it mm -hmm. passes uh, for a medium it is absorbed by the same medium and we, we thought uh, what happened with the, the gravitational wave uh, because the gravitational wave is the oscillate oscillation of the space time itself so yes. what is the necessary medium to absorb this uh, specific well, wave Oh, you... that's a little bit different than, uh, okay, yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, self-absorption in that sense, I will have to think about it, but I, I, I don't think in that sense nothing happens. Well, if, if you believe in extra dimensions, gravity could leak, right, into oh, yeah, those okay. uh, higher yeah. dimensions, and then that, that could uh, be a kind of assumption, if you want. Yeah, but I'm a very conservative guy. I believe that Einstein is right, and, and the dimensions are for yeah okay thank you okay so last I, I chance have, yes. i have a question there um uh does um the space time uh try just like a string to get back to let's say a plane um instead of i mean um if you analyze the stream in a whatever uh man you will say that you you can say that it tries to go to a a minimum energy state, right? Once uh, whatever is perturbated in the string uh, goes off. So, does that happen with space time and gravitational waves? Do they try to go to a minimum energy state? Yeah. Here it is. Is this what is this part here precisely? So this is the part in which I. The black holes had collided. There is only a single black hole. Okay, the minimum state here is that of an unperturbed single black hole. Okay, 
you cannot get rid of the black hole unless you do, you know, Hawking radiation and so on. And uh, there is good progress to show that uh, black holes are stable. So the minimum state is a stable rotating black hole. Okay. And uh, and uh, one one more question. Um, for example, sometimes I I mean if if I if I believe in in, in wavelengths and uh, gravitational wavelengths and all this stuff, uh, I I I can I I think that I guess that space time is actually kind of a a material thing. But is there a chance that space time can be something similar to what Fresnel did uh, all the uh, mathematical uh, thing he did to describe the the personal zones in Optic. The, I'm, I'm sorry, what was the last part that you say? The 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 Fresnel one? The, well, when Fresnel tried to 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 describe the, the in optics the, the Fresnel um uh zones uh he did it through a mathematical uh way that that it was not a physical thing but it described very well the result. So is is space time a, 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 a material thing is is something or is just something that that can um, that can that this is describing uh, other forms of energy and all this stuff. Well, I don't recall exactly what you're talking about, but let me just make an attempt. I mean, uh, we can do we can do descriptions of gravitational wave propagation in the in in the high frequency or separating frequencies in such a way that you can have it like in the optics approximation and maybe that is what you're talking about in which uh, we go to uh, look things more like a ray propagation as opposed to wave propagation but that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, space times had has uh, some refraction index or anything like that. It's just basically separating high frequencies for, for, from low frequencies. Okay, and, and what, what makes uh, space-time um, a real thing? I mean, uh, gravitational waves, uh, is there any other way we can describe it uh, besides uh, GR? Not, not, not me GR, but through space-time? I mean, is there any is there any other chance? Because, well, the short answer is no. That was precisely what all you know the the great insight of Einstein. But there are attempts to do things. I mean, there is this uh, alternative theory of gravity that is called ether gravity. It's not introducing a medium, but uh, I'm not very familiar with that. But it goes a little bit along those ways. Okay. And uh, I mean, we can get into the more philosophical thing here about what do you mean real, okay? Yeah, because at, at some point, I guess, for example, if we, uh, when I picture it in my head and I see these big black holes and these wells that it's uh, doing with space time all this stuff, but uh, uh, it's, 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 it's obvious that it is embedded in some, in, in some place, I mean, right? So if, what I mean is, is that this at is, some point feels like fundamental, but... Uh... No, the, this, the, the embedding thing is just so your brain can uh, uh, get a sense of what this equation is. It's not that that's what it is. It, exactly. I mean, it's just like when you go and learn about the expansion of the universe, this balloon that is expanding that is not what is happening it's just a representation so your brain can uh, can capture the essence of the concept but the space time is real in the sense that uh, you have a, a gravitational wave going by and you're very close to the collision it will destroy you I mean, uh, and it's, it's, it's not, uh, and there is no matter hitting you. It's just that the, the fabric of the space-time is changing so much that is 
deforming you because you're changing the way that distance is the way that the volume that you generate gets the form and that's real okay thank you okay <clears throat> so <laughs> again uh, if uh, anyone has a, a quick last question let's go for it otherwise let's uh, call it a day all right well again thank you to the organizers thank you to all of you and uh, i hope uh, the presentation was not too confusing but i encourage you if you find that uh, uh, you know you want to get into this business please uh, send me an email i'll be happy to provide you more uh, information and uh, have a great day exactly this is what i was about uh, about to say if you, if uh, you're fine with that pablo will uh, send your email around to the students and uh, encourage them to contact you thank you so much all right thank you guys have a nice day thank you